Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Our kids have been following along with us in learning about Daniel. Uh, it's been really neat. I remember on the second week that the kids were going through it, I asked Ben, my son Ben, uh, what he had learned about in church that day, and he said, we talked about Daniel again, and, and, and we didn't even learn about the lions. And, and um, I love that we're going deeper and not just hitting like these standard Bible stories, but learning more about the story of God. And he was able to tell me all about the Babylonians. He was able to tell me that Israel had gone into exile, which is like a big time out. Um, so that's, that's a, a good way of thinking about it. And it's been a lot of fun. And uh, as we've been doing it, if you are a parent who have kids or uh, have been listening to the CD the phrase that keeps worming its way into my head because you can't help it is dare to be a Daniel. How many of you guys have heard that? Dare to be a Daniel. Yeah. Um, and I, you know what? I love that challenge. It's such a good challenge for, for the kids and for us. Um, Travis has been covering a lot about how this book is relevant to all of us as we are citizens of God's kingdom who happen to call the United States our home, and that the call to all of us in these times is to dare to be a Daniel. And I love to imagine what could happen if the church as a body, each of us individually, but standing together, if we all dared to be Daniels. But the question is how? You know, how do we have the, the strength and wisdom to resist Babylon? How do we have the strength to stand up to Babylon? How do we have the wisdom to know where we need to resist? Uh, for that matter, how did Daniel have that? I mean, we, we've learned Daniel was taken from his home when he was not much older than some of the kids that are here today. He was taken from his home and to a foreign land far away, away from his parents, away from everything he knew, and he was was indoctrinated, he was surrounded by the teachings and the ideas of Babylon. Why didn't he become Babylonian? Wouldn't it have been easier? I, I'm sure many of the captives in, from Israel became Babylonian because it just made sense. So um, what, what, hel what helped him? Um, and this morning, I want to show you that Daniel was able to be Daniel only because of his knowledge and his love for God that was fueled by his knowledge and love for God's word. Because you see, Daniel wasn't alone in Babylon. He wasn't. He had a manual. He had a message from the king, a history of his own people that he studied regularly that, to remind himself of his true home and his true king. So today we're going to read from Daniel chapter 9, and up until now we've been covering a lot of the famous stories in Daniel, seeing Daniel's confrontations with Babylon, his, where he'd come into the king's court and stand up, but today we're moving behind the curtains a little bit, and today we're going to see Daniel by himself, and what made him Daniel. So real fast, how many of you kids here, how many of you are here for the first time? This is your first time in big church with the adults, Yeah? Cool. I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, before I start, I just want to tell you guys a little bit about what we do together uh, as a church family, because you guys, you know your Sunday school, but um, up here we come together to worship God together. And one of the ways we do that is by singing songs of praise, which you guys helped us with, and, uh, and you guys saw and participated with. But the other way we do it is uh, we also worship God by reading from the Bible. We love God's word. And, and know that it's very important. So every Sunday, 
uh, someone, usually it's Pastor Travis or Pastor Mark or Pastor Jared, but sometimes it's a member of the church like me, uh, comes up and reads from the Bible and then takes some time to explain what it means and how we can apply it to our lives and uh, how we can live our lives based on what it says. So I want you to see today that Daniel was who he was because of his love for God and for God's word. So let's read together. Uh, From Daniel 9, if you're trying to follow along in your Bible, just know that what I'm reading has been edited a little bit for uh, length. So Daniel 9, it'll be on the screen. It was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede who became king of the Babylonians. So real fast, that tells us that at this point, Daniel had been there for uh, over 65 years. He was probably about 80 years old at this point. Okay? It was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede who became king of the Babylonians. And if we don't have it on the screen, I'll just read it. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and all the people of the land. Lord, you are in the right, but as you see, our faces are covered with shame. O Lord, we and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. We have not obeyed the Lord our God, for we have not followed the instructions he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down on us because of our sins. You have kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you warned. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true, yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing his truth. The Lord our God was right to do all these things, for we did not obey him. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your furious anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. Oh, our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead for your own sake, Lord. Smile again on your desolate sanctuary. Oh, my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. For your own sake, do not delay, O my God. For your people and your city bear your name. I love that passage. I I love that prayer. If you ever want to see a model of a passionate prayer of a faithful, godly man. This is one of the best examples that God gives us in his Bible. And I want to point out a few quick things to you, though, to see how Daniel used God's word to inform his prayer life. Did you see it in the passage? First, look at, look at verse 2. It says, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet. So he began praying after he read Jeremiah the prophet, which is the book of Jeremiah in your Bible. What he read in his Bible led him to pray. And then, notice he referred twice to the law of Moses. The law of Moses is a way of talking about the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Together, those are the law of Moses. And you see, Daniel, he knew his Bible. He knew God's word. And that 
gave him perspective. It gave him a way of seeing his life and his situation that enabled him to stay faithful and do great things for God. Again, Daniel's knowledge of God's word showed him the truth, which in, enabled him to stay faithful and, and follow God. Daniel looked to God's word here to tell him a number of things. First, Daniel's understanding of God's word showed him who he was, who Daniel was, and, and what his situation was. From God's word, he knew that Israel was God's chosen people. And he knew that God had expectations for them, how to live, how to act, how to worship. And sadly, he knew that Israel hadn't obeyed that for a long time. And he knew, because God said it in the Bible, that there were consequences. There were punishments that came from disobedience. And part of that was exile. And so where they were in Babylon was not an accident. That it was part of God's plan. But he also knew from reading in Jeremiah that that exile was coming to an end. So first, God's word showed Daniel the truth about who he was and what was going on. But second, it showed him who God is. Notice he used God's own words to worship him in verse 4. He says, O oh Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenants and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commandments. That's an exact quotation of Deuteronomy 7 9. He is using God's word to praise God. God shows us his truth, and we can rejoice in that and turn it back to God. Um, he also knew from reading his Bible that God is righteous and God is just. He will punish sin. And, and, and that's what he was doing. Um, and God is faithful to fulfill his promises. Both the good promises, that's what we like to remember, um, is that God promises blessings and he's faithful to fulfill those. But God also promises consequences and he promises curses uh, some, and he's faithful to fulfill those as well. Fortunately, uh, Daniel also knew that God is merciful. The whole Bible speaks to God's mercy. And so uh, he could see uh, who God was and that, that God desires to draw his people back to him. So God's word taught Daniel God's character. So he saw who he was and who God is and finally, he responds to that. Notice that he knows a lot about God. He learns about God from studying his Bible, but he doesn't just hold that in his head and say, that's interesting, I'm smart now, I know a lot about God. No, that's not the goal. The goal is to use what we know about God to respond. We see the truth and we believe it, so we live based on it. And Daniel did that. Notice he knew that God listens. So he prayed. He knew that they had sinned. So he confessed and he said, I'm sorry. He knew that God is merciful. So he asked for mercy. And, and finally, he knew that God is faithful. So he was brave enough to remind God of his promises. Daniel used God's word to show him the truth about who he is, who God is, and how he should respond and so guys, going back to the beginning, if we want to dare to be a Daniel, if we want to do that, we too, we need to go to God's word and hold it high in our life. We need to know it well and let it sink deep in us. Because the, how else are you going to know the truth? Guys, we live in Babylon okay? We are surrounded every day, and every single day, you are being hit with messages from all kinds of places telling you who you are, and, and what to do, and what God is like, and what you need, but only God's word can tell you the truth. Let me show you one example of how this made itself very clear to me in a surprising way. I love Thomas the Tank Engine, all right? I, I, I do. How many of you guys like Thomas? <laughs> good, good. How many of you guys, maybe, how many of you guys used to like Thomas? Anybody? 
Cool. How many parents have seen more Thomas than uh, you'd, you'd care to? All right. Um, well, I grew up with Thomas, and so I knew that as soon as I had a, a son, that he'd be getting uh, Thomas train tracks and Thomas clothes and a Thomas backpack. And, of course, he'd be watching the TV show. And let's be honest, I, I did too. Um, but the thing is, I was struck one day, because you only need to watch a few episodes uh, before you learn that there's something that's really important to Thomas. What is the most important thing to Thomas? Anybody know? He wants to be really useful. Thomas, above anything else, wants to be really useful. And if you live on the island of Sodor, if you're an engine, you, the most important thing in life is to be really useful. Where you are on the island of Sodor depends on your usefulness. And, uh, excuse me, and it's, your status is directly dependent on how useful you are. An engine only has value and worth if it's really useful. If you're not useful, you don't count. And that's, that theology is fine for imaginary engines on the Isle of Sodor. But it's terrible theology for humans made in the image of God. And so I didn't expect that I would have to filter for my three-year-old, but I had to sit down, I had to talk to Ben, I had to say, hey, Ben, it's a very good thing to be useful, okay? But even if you're not, you still matter. The Bible tells us that God loves us, and, and we have meaning simply because he made us. And... and uh, it doesn't matter whether you're the strongest person in the world or completely, utterly helpless. You have value. We can be helpless because God is our helper. And this, this may seem like a silly example, but really that, this belief has real consequences in our laws, in the lives that we deem valuable, in... in uh, where we invest our money, time, and energy. These messages are coming to us from everywhere. Look, church, we breathe the air of Babylon. We are in an ocean of Babylon, and if we just drift along with the current like jellyfish, if we're just floating along with the current, we will be carried to Babylon. We need to have purpose. We need to be, not be jellyfish. We need to be dolphins that swim with active purpose in the direction of God's commands. And we have to do that by letting God be our primary influence. And we must, the, the biggest way we know God is through his word. We must soak in his word and let it inform all our questions of who we are, who he is, and what we should do. Church, hear God's call to us, straight from the heart of the law of Moses. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Notice the direct link between the command to love God and know his law. Knowing God and loving him go hand in hand. And isn't that true about our other relationships? When, the more you love someone, the more you want to know them. And we know God primarily through his word. That is how he chose to reveal himself to us. The words of God matter. We must treat them like they matter. And God says here that we must teach them diligently to our children. Not casually, not whenever it comes up, but regularly and intentionally. And guys, I'm going to be honest. I read this and thought about it, and I felt real convicted um, because I don't do this. I love God. I love his word. But being regular and, and, and intentional about teaching him 
to my children is, is hard. And, and, you know, sometimes I'll feel convicted, and then I'll be like, okay, we're going to have a family worship time. And Carissa can testify to this, that, like, I'll have a plan, and after dinner, we'll gather all the kids together, and we'll read a story out of the Jesus Storybook Bible. And, uh, it, and it feels kind of awkward, and the kids are being really squirrely, and they're all, and I don't think they're listening, and I don't know what to say, and it's uncomfortable, and I hate being uncomfortable. And so the next night when it comes time to do it, I'm like, well, these other things are going on. We'll set that aside. We'll come back to it. And the next day, they, and it becomes easier and easier to set aside, and, and six months go by, and, and uh, I haven't done anything until I start to feel guilty and convicted again. Church, I want, like, I'm being honest here, I want to repent. I want to say I'm sorry for my numb affections and, and my sinful love of comfort, for my cowardice, honestly, for not being bold. I want my life and my parenting to reflect a love for God through a love for the Bible. I want my children to see and treasure their Savior because they know him. My prayer today as as we leave is that as the Holy Spirit brings the weight of God's word on our hearts in different ways, that for each one of us, we would treasure God and treasure his word in ourselves, in our families, and in our life together. One final thought, Um, just as as an encouragement. I was thinking this way, week about how Daniel could have such a knowledge and trust and love for God. And you know what came to me? His parents. That they knew God's command in Deuteronomy and they responded to it with obedience. I am certain that Daniel's parents loved God and his law and they, I'm certain that they taught it diligently to their children, and even all the efforts of the Babylonian Empire could not compete with the foundation of love and God's truth that they had laid in their son's heart. They may be unnamed in the Bible and in history, but there is no question that they changed history and the world because of their simple faithfulness to God's commands. Parents, Church, we too can have such an impact. Let's be encouraged by their example and let us strive to be faithful too. So we need help in this. So would you pray with me? Oh. Father, we thank you that, you that you have made yourself known. You didn't leave us by ourselves. You didn't leave us just wondering who you are. God, you reached out to us. You have made yourself known. You live in your word. God, help us. Help us uh, in our own lives and in our, all aspects of our life that we would treasure your word. Give us delight when we don't feel delighted. Open our eyes to your glory in what you see, in what we see in, in your word. Help us to see you in it. Help us to love you. God, we need your help. Bless us today. Bless the parents here, Lord, that they would be faithful, that you would walk with them and give them the strength and and give them ideas, give them uh, everything they need. Lord, I pray for these children that are here with us. God, root them in you. Root them in your word. Let them grow uh, to love you. Lord, I pray that for all of us that you would bless our minds that that we would know you more. Lord, that you would bless our hearts, that we would love you more. God, that you would bless our wills, that we would obey you. We need you today. In Jesus' name, amen. And guys, I just want to quickly say, um, I hope this is working on you in different ways. If you're looking for something practical, I hope to put something up on the city, some ideas, maybe to to work this out. Um, But God will give you wisdom. He will get, he will direct you. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. 
So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the